there is a 90% chance that one or more of the 12 Bitcoin spot ETFs will be approved in the next 90 days. And even conservative estimates suggest this would blow up Bitcoin by 74% just within the first year. So here's the question. How do you use this near certain event to maximize your BTC gains? Well, in part one of this series, we discuss four strategies for maximizing your gains before the ETF launches. And in part two, Ben Lilly, JJ, Ray, and Cody explain how they will play their four strategies during and after the launch of the ETF. And believe it or not, this is where the magic actually happens. Because as you'll find out, the biggest gains may not even happen until 2025 or beyond, but you have to stay in crypto to get the payoff. Let's hear what the Crypto Brain Trust has to share. What are you doing during the uh, the announcement? I'll say, you know, when Cody's chirping in my ear about Solana, that would be when I would possibly look at it. Uh, mostly because you're looking at Stack and Sat. So if you had some sort of Bitcoin allocation, when to allude to basically get to the milkshake analogy again, you know, Bitcoin is going to move outsized pace for the rest of the market. I know a lot of traders have been looking at that ETH BDC trade of late. Uh, it's not, it looked really good last week. It's looking less attractive this week. I think if that ETF gets approved, especially by the end of the week, that trade is going to look pretty rough. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of those traders enter that too early. And I don't think you really need to worry about the timing of that either. It's just once that approval happens, you see Bitcoin go on its run, then that would be the time to go ahead and start looking at that. So I, that's when I would rotate into Ethereum uh, specifically. If Solana earns my attention later on, then it would it might be Solana <laughs> at the time. An underrated aspect of that too is if we do get the BTC ETF approval, then um, Ethereum is all but assured to coming in 2024. So you basically move from front running one news catalyst to front running the next there. I think that's a good trade. Yeah, you're well. you're you're mm -hmm. almost betting on the catch up play. Mm -hmm. Like okay, BTF's got its ETF, it's approved, everything's great. Like what's next? And that's like a big question mark. And then Ethereum, you're sitting there like, oh, it's got an ETF, it's next in line, it's gonna start moving. But I think also, like not only will the whole asset class get legitimized and Ethereum will come up in the conversation as well, but I think because a lot of Wall Street and some of those entities are actually building some tech that has some interoperability with Ethereum, I think you're going to see a lot of discussion come from them as well that they do have some projects that are being built on Ethereum tied up with the kind of the rollout of the ETF. And so you can think of that as like, you know, afterburners that are going to take place on that trade. Mm -hmm. So are you out then of the miners on the actual approval notice? And that's when you're starting to look at these um, alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay. JJ, are you, are you doing the same? My framework for that, like I do think if we get the spot ETF, it's probably going to lead to a blow off top. Um, whether or not that's a long-term blow off top, like in the course of years, or if it's just going to be a couple of weeks or whatnot. So I just want to be mostly de-risked in the event that we get a spot ETF listing and then ultimately wait for some kind of dislocation event is kind of like long-term mental model, like have the ETF and then we get a big wipeout. Then obviously you want to go back to BTC following that. And then well, from there, if BTC gets another leg up, consolidates, then I think I, you, I would start looking to rotate into alts, but that's dependent on DXY. So if we pull up the DXY risk rating chart, had a big drop down today and it's starting to look very risk on, which is encouraging. But in the event of a spot ETF, what I would want to see is BTC correct, wipe out some speculation. And then if DXY is in the green territory here, showing that it's a high risk environment uh, paired with some ETH strength as well on the ETH price strength chart. I think that's kind of your fat pitch to go all in alts there. I think that's as clean of a setup as you'll get if we get it. I don't know if it'll be that perfect, but that's kind of the way I'm framing it or waiting for. Well, JJ, let me ask you, I mean, assuming that we get this in January, we got the halving coming in uh, April. Uh, any thoughts there on how those two events kind of play off together? I mean, you, you just talked about, um, let's say the approval comes in January. You're saying risk off, so you're now sitting outside of, of uh, Bitcoin. 
you holding it off and then maybe around uh, the having are you looking at that or is it pre, you know totally yeah. dixie dependent it could sync up that way right where we get mm-hmm. kind of a spot etf drops in quarter one um when's the having may uh, I, last i checked it was april april, april yeah. so maybe we get the btc mini blow off top uh, upon etf listing in quarter one and then the having narrative kicks in and then maybe by may or so we start to see some real heat in a full-blown bull market in um crypto but it's very like level by level day by day thing with me so it's hard to draw these projections too far out but that's kind of the ideal setup i would be looking for to get all the exposure like i don't feel comfortable in like being extremely long alts when dxy is still above uh it's 200 day moving average for sure i feel like there's a lot a lot of risk there i mean the halving is usually also still the news event right mm-hmm. so i think it could give you like yeah. a good opportunity to like play play the range because like if we see a sell the news event for uh etf approval in january then people get excited again uh say feb march for that happening and then the happening comes and again sell the news event I, I think that could give you like a couple of like good opportunities to like increase your stack um if you buy when people are getting bearish after all the selling and like uh, a spreadsheet of all these You got to keep like a spreadsheet of spreadsheet of all these events coming. Yeah, out. yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, or you could just like listen to the podcast every week, and yeah. uh, we'll probably give you that information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like it's quite common to see like pullbacks of like thirty percent and even more than that. Uh, like I think in twenty twenty one, um, bull just saw pull like four to five pullbacks of thirty percent for ETH. Uh, and like run the same for Bitcoin. So I, I guess you could see the same. Uh, Is Cody trying to sell some volatility on Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe that's how you you uh, you get to buy more Solana. Yeah. <laughs> Use that yield, baby. <laughs> well, well, Cody, what are you doing? I mean, are you have you sold at this point? The the ETFs have been approved. Are you selling out of your Solana position? Kind of holding back the same way JJ just talked about for Bitcoin. Yeah, I think I think you have to distribute some coins into that. Uh, I think you've seen like front running or front running, um, and if we don't see a top on the day, like I think you see it fairly close, even maybe before. So, so I think you you kind of have to to be distributing into that and wait again for another for for the pullback and start buying again when people are desperate. Because um, I think a lot of people will be very excited about the ETF. And you've seen it with these products, so like they don't really become another net success. And there's also like ETFs in in Europe and whatnot that don't see many influx. I don't think that's what you're going to see uh, for an ETF in the states. I think the economy of the state is much more financialized, and you're going to see much uh, bigger interest. But mm. uh, I think that will take time. Right? Like a, a lot of the, the retail that wants to, to buy Bitcoin, they, they, they've already bought. Like we're waiting now for like institutions, uh, private, uh, like Wait so, for your sorry, like, retirement uh, account. Basically. Yeah, exactly. You're waiting for, for those kind of people that like don't want to really go on Coinbase to buy a Bitcoin. But like if that Bitcoin is structured through an ETF, then yeah, like that is within their mandate. And like they will probably locate a, a small percentage, but a small percentage of like pension funds and like uh bit of uh, hedge funds and like uh ultra high net worth individuals and whatnot like that 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 is a lot especially for for a market such as bitcoin so so i think long term we're gonna see a lot of uh, uh or like a big movement coming from that in the near term like we were when you were talking about soul below ten dollars after ftx i kind of think of the etf as the inverse of that right like it's going to be so incredibly bullish that it can't get any more bullish which is probably a good time to sell at least in the near term just because at that point, like how how much better can things actually get, right? Like maybe it could continue on forever, becomes a new global reserve currency, but I don't think that's happening within the next year. So it's probably a good time to de-risk. Like who do you think is out there not buying until the, the, the day that the mm-hmm. DF is approved? No one. Yep. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Literally no one. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Ray, I want to bring you bring you in here because uh, you were talking more. You're you're looking at buying the dip. Um, you had some more tactical plays, but more just in general. I'm summarizing. You had more buy the dip on the news of the ETF. Are you same game plan here, looking to sell 
look for a, a, a decent sized pullback to re-enter and then take advantage perhaps of the halving? Um, I'm probably a 30 to 40% profit taker. Um, if the ETFs approved and price goes parabolic, but of course it's going to be, you know, dependent upon what's happening at that time and, and what the different metrics that we look at are saying. So things like the daily and weekly RSI reading, the percentage of long and short-term holders in profit, um, other metrics like the Bitcoin and VRV, if they're looking overheated, then those would be signs for me mm-hmm. to possibly take some profit. Um, but I think it's good. Like we as analysts put a lot of research into trading Bitcoin and you know doing all the analysis. So you need to pay yourself for that time by taking some profits. Um, and you also need to um, you need to kind of like I, I like to trade with with size since I'm not really using perpetuals or futures right now. Um, and another thing to think about when you're trading futures and you cash out, it's settled in USDC or USDT usually. So if you're going to go buy Bitcoin, then you're buying it at what that price is now. So think about like, do you want to trade Bitcoin now and make investments into it incrementally while price is low? Um, and then you have this position that you're going to hold long post, way, way, way post ETF. If Bitcoin becomes digital gold, that's where all your multiples of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten X are going to come from is from the Bitcoin that you bought super cheap that's now worth six figures a coin versus trading futures and buying Bitcoin at market price then. So, um, you know, you can shorten that path by holding some spot long Bitcoin. But um, yeah, I'm probably a profit taker on the day or the day after of the um of the etf being approved dependent on metrics um okay and dependent i guess on inflow like eventually we'll get data on when are the actual etfs actually launching how much inflow do they take in how does price respond to that so that's kind of why i'm suggesting that people have some dry powder and take profits because Bitcoin price will still whipsaw. It's not just going to go up only after ETF um, forever. So there will be more opportunities to kind of play that whipsaw price action in the futures markets and also, um, you know, with spot Bitcoin. So that, that's kind of my view. Yeah. No, I think that's helpful. So what I'm hearing uh, from everyone so far is this is most likely is is it, is the moment to sell, take some profits, hide some dry, dry powder, expecting that we're going to see a, a sizable pullback. Ben, I, I just want to bring it back to you because I, th- I think that was what you were stating, kind of similar to what everyone's noting here. It's a good time to to sell out. Is that right from your perspective? Well, I'm kind of assuming that you're trading with the PTC denominated account. And so mm-hmm. you're trying to move into the miners to go ahead and attempt to two to three X your account. Um, of course, there's a lot of risk involved in trying to figure out how to 10 X an ETF move. And so that shouldn't <laughs> be understated, right? Like you yeah. need to nail everything perfectly. And we're not here holding anybody's hand. We're not financial advisors. We're just yes, cartoons on the screen, right? So you need to take that with a lot of. A lot of <laughs> grains of salt, <laughs> if you will. Salt, yeah. Uh, but you know, to get into it, it's you know, I'm trying to stay exposed to the ecosystem because you know, an ETF is for the industry like a one-time event, and we don't mm-hmm. really necessarily know. Like, a question popped in my head as everyone's chatting right now is, when when is this sell the event? Is it the actual announcement? Or is it the first day that the ETF begins trading? And just right there, that little degree of uncertainty in my own mind, like I don't want to lose exposure to the space. I don't want to just sell into fiat per se because I, I don't want to miss out on an asset class that moves in a very parabolic fashion when it decides to go ahead and move. And that's why I was leaning towards the ETH PDC trade because you're still exposed to essentially a tide that could lift all boats. And as far as a beta exposure to Bitcoin, that's where I see Ethereum being a better setup uh, in my mind. Okay. 
Well, so this actually, I think, is a good pivot to get into what anybody who's listening to this wants to know, right? So we've talked about where you're positioned before. During, it sounds like most likely it's, it's going to be taking some exposure off the table. Again, Ray pointed out uh, very wisely that you need to be looking at the metrics. And Ben, what you just shared, I think, re- reinforces that, that it's a question of, is it when it's approved, when it starts trading? Is there a bump afterwards? Is there a lag? We obviously don't know. We're going to continue to monitor that, which is why we suggest you like and subscribe and you come back to this channel because we're going to be talking about it as we head into uh, to 2024. Uh, but in general, I think what we're saying is there's likely a good opportunity to de-risk. But now we want to get into what everyone else is asking for, which is after. Okay, so now we're moving into the period after the ETF. It's been approved. Perhaps we're past beyond where we've seen a pullback. We're getting into the meteor part, later part of 2024. How are you guys thinking about this next trade? Again, we're looking at trying to 10x our Bitcoin. And I think we've already done that play in the before and during. What are we doing now? I think if we get really overheated, like say we start reaching um, new all-time high territory, like 80 to 100K, I think that's where selling upside volatility could possibly be an attractive play. Obviously, depending on main things, like if the dollar just completely crashes, I, I wouldn't want to be short Bitcoin in any way there. But if it looks like another typical cycle and things are kind of going the way I mentally see it now, I imagine at those levels, selling volatility would be a very attractive way to earn some extra yield and ultimately earn yourself some more Bitcoin. So just walk us through that, what that trade would look like. You're, you're saying own, owning, uh, winning Bitcoin and selling calls against it? Yep. So I would do covered call options. Um, say Bitcoin goes to 100K uh, sometime in 2024. Uh, provided that DXY isn't trading like below 70 or anything crazy like that. I think at that lo- at that level, you could probably sell some crazy strike prices like 200K calls. Um, they might be going for, say, $1,000 each, right? Which means mm-hmm. if Bitcoin continues to go up, you still own your spot Bitcoin, you're exposed to all that upside, and your losses on the contracts you're selling wouldn't kick in until it's above 200000 If it doesn't reach 200000 those contracts expire worthless. You need to keep all that yield. And I think in a scenario where Bitcoin does blow off like that and move into insane territories, then I think there's a lot of volatility to be sold for very lucrative prices. Mm. 150, 180 implied volatility. I think we're trading like in the mid 50s right now. Mm -hmm. So Ben, what about you? What's the play of the year? Are you going in with, uh, with JJ? Setting up a cartel to sell volatility? Are you? Uh, do you have a different trade in mind to do your sweet ten x? Uh, I'm, I'm taking out insurance. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm actually looking at puts, um, and I know they're going to be pretty pricey at that time period because of what I said with the implied volatility. But my, my hope would be to figure out how to get my portfolio to be debt. Uh, delta neutral. So that's essentially your price agnostic. You're not worried whether price goes up, price goes down, but you're kind of, you're content with that price. But I, I don't want to, I don't want to unload spot. Um, if I have that position, mostly for tax purposes, but really the idea there is if you do think everything's overheated, you know, you're going to be able to start profiting on fiat on the downside and then go ahead and restack yourself for what I think is the really the big play here. Like we're trying to really move the needle on our stack with this ETF. And I think the ETF news, I think gold, the analogy works here, which is when GLD went ahead and, and started and it got its approval in 2004. One year later, the price of gold was the same. I think it, it didn't have the impact right away as everybody expected. And I think when it comes to Bitcoin, it's not going to be a one year later type of deal because these these cycles are multi-year. And so when it actually does have its blow off top, it starts to come back down. In my mind, that is when you start preparing for what the real the real ETF move is going to be when you know, everybody kind of has these channels set up. The perspectives for various mutual funds and various funds in general start to get changed so that allows for exposure to Bitcoin. And now you have essentially this natural drift for everybody trying to allocate, let's say, 100 bucks every week to some sort of portfolio that they don't even know what assets are in it. And some robo-advisor is, 
is basically giving them ten dollars of exposure every week after week. Like when do those channels get put in place? Like that's going to take a little bit of time. And for that reason, I have a chart on gold. Uh, that if the producer can pull up, you can see that one year later, gold was trading at the same price, uh, which is this vertical red line. And then you just have this continual march higher. Like that is that is a move for gold, especially for gold, from $450 to almost $2,000. So what is Bitcoin going to look like when it comes to 2026, 2027? Like that is something that... Right now, with this ETF in this cycle, like I want to prepare for that move for Bitcoin. Because at the same time, there, if there's that much money coming into the space, one of the big issues holding ordinals back right now is the amount of capital flowing in. Right Now you have an asset that is kind of getting the hat tip that it's okay. Everybody can go ahead and talk about it at the various tables that they're all sitting at. And now VCs can point to various funds that are going ahead to allocate and now you have ordinal projects that are starting to gain some traction. They have a little maturity. They can go now from seed rounds into Series A and Series B. And now you're talking about you know much bigger rounds in terms of capital flowing in. And these projects with you know starting to mature, starting to get full developer teams that are not just like three or four people. You know you're talking a few dozen individuals working on a project, moving into this March higher. And if ordinals can bring that sort of demand to the network, you have these the 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 drift higher from robo advising. Like this is setting up to be a massive move, I think. In the, the believe I, I hate saying it, but the next cycle, we're not even <laughs> in this one, but the next one. If you, I, I almost think 10x might be understating what could po- possibly happen here. To give an idea oh. of how long we've been looking forward to this spot ETF uh, news, <laughs> Ben and I we've been talking about it since early last year, but. We actually wrote a piece, I think it was like last summer, where we discussed kind of this, the catalyst that this could bring. And one of the analogies we used, we kind of used a fractal here of, um, we don't have it in the charts, unfortunately. This is just coming off the top of my head right now. But in the 70s, the government lifted the gold window, which allowed private citizens to own gold for the first time since the 20s. And I think like within a year, that's when gold really kind of took, that's when you like you turn on Fox News and you see like um, those commercials for boomer gold funds and things like that. That's really when it took mind in in the public conscious, right? Then everybody all of a sudden had a gold allocation because inflation was high, similar to now. And the price of gold went from like under a hundred bucks to over 800, I want to say. Yeah, the and, comments, uh futures was like opened up, I think in 71. Yep. So that move, you know, preceded that, uh, those futures rolling out. So, so that, what I'm hearing is the signal is when we see Bitcoin advertised on a conservative talk show host. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that's, that's the signal we need to look for, JJ? Bitcoin is like the, uh, it's the millennial version of gold in many ways, uh, right? So like the same way you have like those boomers that are just absolute gold bugs. I think Bitcoin will be the same way 50 years from now. You'll be having boomer commercials on, get exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, I'm waiting to hear about it on the podcast route for for people that don't know anything about cryptos. Here's your card. Go out and buy it. It's time to get it. What's really interesting, I'm just thinking about this now. Um, So over that time span, the government had tons of gold and they didn't really have a way to sell it, but they had debt problems similar to now. And ultimately, they were able to unload a lot of that onto the public. And right now, I think the government, the US government is still the largest Bitcoin holder um, (laughs) or close to it. So don't don't count that out, right? Where the government's kind of in on the pump here, just to get some exit liquidity at much higher <laughs> levels. Hopefully, fix some debt <laughs> issues. There we go, Ben. Um, I, I just want to. Can you just summarize one last time? I just want to make sure I understand your position here, because it sounds like you know after during you're looking for a pullback, uh, you're trying to minimize, you know, stay in the game, so to speak, and continue to have exposure. And then, can you just walk us through what you were saying in terms of maintaining that exposure during the after part uh, for that year, maybe two years as we're looking for the run up? Because I, I think you were talking about, I, I think I heard you say buy puts, but if you could just summarize that one last time. Yep, yep. So you buy puts in terms of the amount that you wanna you wanna purchase. There's a figure that's delta, and and you really want to figure out where your delta would be. And I know that's kind of a nuanced topic, but it's it's basically like if your spot holdings were to lose $1,000, your put contracts would gain $1,000. And so 
you you do need to manage that position over time because that type of change in dollar amount for a book contract will change over time. And it's kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about today, but you don't necessarily need to get a book contract to do that. You know, you could sell spot and you could just unload it and just hold fiat and for another year until you start to see that the pullback. And what I would stress is just because price just keeps marching higher in this coming cycle, that doesn't mean you need to worry as much. Like if you just want to time it, and just put like a little calendar date, if you will. Like if the having is in April of next year, just go ahead and put on your calendar April 2025, big circle on that date, consider selling, right? Like this is happening in every having, and you are in a very good position. And you shouldn't yeah. discount how easy that process could be. And then now just sit on the sidelines for another year or two, wait for everything to blow up like we just saw again. Probably Grayscale will be blowing up Solana and we'll be right back at it in terms of the courtrooms once again. But don't, you know, don't record this if you if you will and repeat it back to me. But <laughs> um, uh, you know, yeah, I'm gonna hold it to this again. Don't record this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. we're not recording this. The lead oh, producer. <laughs> yeah, go go back to the producers. <laughs> Ray, I want to ask you, because we're going to get into the probably what I'm going to imagine is the 100x coming from Cody as he starts to talk <laughs> through going going down the risk curve in a minute. But before we do that, Ray, your thoughts here, are you kind of same playbook that you just heard from JJ? They, they kind of gave two different perspectives on how to play the longer term after the, the ETF is, is kind of on board. What are your thoughts there? How are you playing that to try and get that 10x? Hmm, probably trading wider market momentum. So I'd be keeping an eye on Bitcoin dominance versus altcoin dominance. I still like the ETH BTC pair. I think um, averaging into Ethereum and playing kind of the, the, like it just had a range break. There's people that are saying ETH is going to do a 6X or go to, you know, 3,000, 4,000. Some people are saying it's going to go to 6,000. So, I mean, it's, it's a clear kind of, dominant asset in this space it's endemic to DeFi and whatnot so i think having exposure to um to ethereum over the long term will be a good way to build up profits and then one can decide how much of that they want to leave in ethereum or uh, put it in bitcoin or i guess we can go back to just trading you know altcoin bitcoin pairs again wherever those exist um but um, yeah, I think playing wider market momentum, if Bitcoin goes into a bull market and this ETF is a liquidity magnet for the entire space and you start to see things like miners doing well, ordinal inscriptions mooning again, NFTs popping off, speculative altcoins and DeFi farming coming back, there should be a lot of opportunities to explore um, within the altcoin space and the DeFi space. So um, assuming one's flush from all their other Bitcoin investments leading into the ETF, then there should be sufficient capital to go and explore um, what's available in the altcoin market. And one thing that's nice, when the market is in kind of a defined trend, especially for altcoins, when Bitcoin's predictably going up or if Bitcoin is predictably consolidating within a range and there's no... There's no like black swans around the corner. I'm assuming with the ETF, that also means we're getting some sort of regulatory framework. So you're kind of at calmer seas and you can expand your um, horizons and the market's a little bit more stable. So it's easier to just use basic te technical analysis to play, um, you know, like market structure shifts and support resistance flips and a lot of those kind of large cap altcoins like Matic, AVAX, Arbitrum, ETH, Solana, the list goes on and on. So it becomes a little bit easier to plant some seeds and set some alerts in your trading view and um, generate a lot of profit from playing those kind of range bound moves within altcoins and those breakouts. So um I think that that would be the strategy in the post ETF world um, is to go and play with altcoins and at the same time shovel some of that profit back into this long Bitcoin position. That's what I did in 
all the previous bull markets. Um, so uh, hopefully that happens again. You know? yeah. <laughs> Can I simplify that real quick? Because you know this might actually draw some context to what Ray's hitting at, which is like, you know, in July 2016, you had the halving. Then you go ahead and you pull up like an ETH BTC chart and you look at where that was trading in June 2017, about a year later. Right. I mean, we're talking from 0.012, or I'm sorry, 0 0.019 or 0 0.02 all the way up to 0 0.014. So major move. And then you go ahead and you fast forward to 2020. Having was May 2020. And that ETH BDC chart, 0 0.022, it looks like, right around there. And about a year later, May 2021, you're at 0 0.08. So, I mean, these are major major moves. And if you just kind of use that framing for when things are going to be moving and get overheated and take advantage of what Ray's saying with the altcoin market, like right there, there's your framework. Mm. Sounds pretty tight. Sounds pretty, something you can definitely go after. Uh, and I, I see Cody smiling on the screen. I'm almost a little scary. I feel like the Joker is about to come out of him as he starts to talk about 10,000 X's as we go down the risk curve on, on the Solana front. Cody, I want to you know walk us through what you're looking at here because I, I feel like you're you're going to talk about going further down the risk curve and what that can mean for uh, for your returns in in pursuit of the 10x Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, this is considering that we this is considering that um, that the ETF launches us into a new bull market, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think what you're going to see or what you're going to want to do is go down the risk curve and that means going into even more risky altcoins. Uh, if my bet is that Solana is going to outperform, then I have to bet on Solana alt altcoins uh, outperforming when the bull market gets uh, moving in earnest. Right? And I think the stage is set for them to do so. The the FTX, the FTX debacle did two things. It suppressed the price of the Solana-related tokens that were already out there, and it forced um, it forced Solana projects into not releasing a token um, because they knew that no one was going to buy that. Like there was no one buying Solana. Almost like there there was no way anyone was gonna gonna buy a, a Solana-related token. So now you're sitting on a bunch of new projects that have gotten quite successful and have been seeing lots of inflows of TBL and whatnot, but they are, they don't have a token yet. Um, if you look at the top uh, gainers by TBL over the past month, uh, if we can look at that image uh, producer, you're going to see that one, two, three, four, five, six, I think, of these, uh, which are like the, the, as I said, the top um, projects by Inflow of TVL over the last month, they don't have a token yet. You got Armada, mm. you got Fluxping, uh, arguably the two most successful ones here are Jito and Marginfy. Jito is uh, liquid staking mixed with MEV to like um, increase your rewards. Marginfy is a lending protocol that is also getting into liquid staking on top of the Jito uh, Jito Soul token. And other than that, you also have the Tensor, which is the equivalent of Blur for Solana, we saw that after Ethereum, the most um, active and valuable NFT market was that on Solana. Uh, it obviously was not as successful as Ethereum um, price was, or like on volume wise, but it saw as much as like 10% of its volume uh, for weeks. Uh, so that is probably also going to be quite um, quite valuable when they launch a token. You also have a couple of projects that have already announced that they're launching a token in an airdrop. That would be Pith, which is an oracle for Solana. They also do some stuff on other chains like Arbitrum, but they, they are mainly focused on Solana. And you have the Jupiter aggregator, which is an aggregator for all DEXs that are also launching perps and so they, they had a great product. I, I don't want to yeah. shield them too much, but any <laughs> buy that I do on Solana, I, I do through Jupiter. They 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 are, they are yeah. So, so yeah, the, let me let me just with, uh, yeah. I, I just to clarify here your point. Like, so when you're saying that these are projects that we're looking at that haven't yet launched a token, how exactly are you getting exposure to this? 
And so, you can be talking about holding Solana. Ooh, yeah. One thing you want to do is start using them. A lot of these projects are going to do an airdrop. In fact, Pith and Jupiter already, already announced an airdrop. I don't know how big the Pith one is. I know it, it's it, it, like at least, I think, I'm, I'm, don't quote me this, but around like 5 6%, I believe. And Jupiter is around like 40% of the supply. They are airdropping out of the gate. Again, this might be a little off, but I think it, it's that actually correct. Uh, so you want to be using those Armada, Fluxbeam, Jito, Margin5, because all of these guys are probably going to want to reward the their users, and they're going to do so through an airdrop. And once that those tokens are launched, then if the valuations make sense, you want to start, you want to buy them. Um, as I said, when Solana has already reached, maybe not all time highs, but like it's already trading as if we're in a bull market, you want to start cycling those Solana gains into into these uh, Solana altcoins. And if you compare the market caps of so, tokens on Solana to the equivalents on, on Ethereum, you'll see that they are heavily mispriced. Um, so if, you, if we can look at the... Orca, to, Orca chart, like yeah, that at the peak was 200 million in in what's the name in uh, in valuation. Uh, we're already almost at 100 because yeah, Solana has been right there. But if you compare it to the market cap of Uniswap at peak, it's still nothing. Uh, market Uniswap had 20 billion uh, in market cap at the peak. I'm not saying Orca is gonna get close to that, but at least 10 percent of that. It's not out of its world. Same goes for the lending markets. Uh, if we can look at Solent right now, <laughs> it has a market cap of like 25 million, I believe. This is the leading lending protocol. I think March and Fire might be a better, um, it's never a better bet, but because they are more innovative, they're, they're, innov they're innovating most related to risk parameters. And they're quite a uh, safe uh, lending market to use. But yeah, the market cap, for instance, of Aave at the peak was eight billion. The market cap of Compound was four billion. If you get anything close to that for for these Solana projects, uh, you can get some nice returns. Mm. And yeah, and you also you also have some unique uh, products. Like you have Star Atlas, which I don't know if you guys know Eve Online, but like it's probably the the most developed uh, game economy out there. Star Atlas Kanda wants to do something similar uh, on blockchain. And then you also have Helium, which used to be its own chain. Uh, and now they pivoted to Solana. They are doing, the, I think the, the the narrative or the sector is the centralized infrastructure. Um, they are doing something like every node is like, uh, what's the name, like a Wi-Fi provider or something? something like that to be honest i i always always thought that they were kind of sketch but they know a lot of uh like a, a lot of smart people that i follow within seoul uh are very excited about this project so i think it's time for me to, to read up on them <laughs> okay well i i, I want to ask you a question so this, this is the price chart this is in dollars is that right uh yeah or that's no, market, cap. market cap okay yeah that's the market cap so you would have like a market cap right now of like around 250 million yeah. And at peak, it was $5 billion. As I said, they moved from their own chain to Solana. Um, mm. So maybe they do not command such a high uh, valuation anymore. Uh, as we know, projects that have their own chain uh, command usually higher valuations. But I think they, they found that like they could not uh, make the economics work within their own chain. And they pivoted to Solana. And to be fair to Solana, like... The, this helium like brings a lot of uh, transaction and whatnot, and we have seen the Solana chain handle that without a hiccup. So I think this is just, just for the reinforces uh, that Solana is great tech. Helium has some controversy. I don't remember the details of it, but a lot of the foundation members I think overpaid themselves. I didn't I mean, follow it closely. Correct. Yes, that's not new <laughs> crypto at all. But it was definitely promising, and maybe it is still promising. I don't keep track of it, but it was a pretty innovative piece of tech that was going on where you essentially could go ahead and pay for data. Mm. So, Cody, just to kind of recap here, what you're saying is, as the this is after we've seen probably the 
I, I guess what, what do you, what do your mind is timeline here, right? Are you looking at you said you said bull market? So if the ETF is kind of kicking off a bull market, we start to see BTC start to run. We start to see the momentum. Maybe some of the charts that Ray's already talked about. That's when you're seeing taking some of this Solana and moving down the risk curve into some of these other projects, and then um, seeing if you can capture some of those airdrops. Yeah, it also depends on how you want to play it, right? Like, maybe you want to position yourself when there's a pullback, uh, you're free to do so. But I think these tokens are very illiquid. So if we see a deep pullback, these projects can go down like 80%, 90%, even if we are in the midst of our market, just because the liquidity is super thin. Um, but yeah, I think the idea is that ETF gets approved. Whether we get the pullback or not, we'll know in the weeks after that. And I don't think you're going to miss much of uh, the, the gains that would be coming from those uh, those altcoins. So if we get the pullback, great. Maybe you can use that to start positioning yourself in this. But I mm-hmm. think you want to buy most of it when you see Solana already moving uh, with the whole market. Um, and you usually don't miss much of the moves moves in these uh, smaller altcoins because they tend to to have a lag. Uh, so they tend to only start moving in earnest when it's clear that that Solana is in a bull phase. Mm. Um, it's the same with like any other um, altcoin, for instance, Ethereum or not. Like you also always see the, the, this kind of lag for smaller projects. Um, and what you want to do is, yeah, start cycling those gains that you have uh, gotten on Solana into a smaller uh, place. Again, you have to keep it nimble because they are very illiquid uh, and much more riskier than Solana. Um, but yeah, either cycle some of, of those gains uh, and use those airdrops as maybe starter positions. And that those airdrops you're going to get just by using Solana. So so. Yeah, okay, just use so, it for a bit. <laughs> like, yeah, it, you're not yeah. going to spend much on fees. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I feel like what you're talking about is is going beyond the 10x. The the risk profile obviously is a lot higher. You just mentioned the the very thin, um, very thin liquidity, which can lead to very, I would say, explosive moves in either direction. Also, when you're looking to actually sell out, that can be a challenge, right? To actually find that you have sufficient liquidity to actually absorb uh, the supply that you're selling. Yeah, I mean, I think you you need to go into this uh, risky market for like I don't know five ten percent of your stack. Again, you have to be well, like know that it is. If if Solana is riskier than I don't know Bitcoin, uh, and you're you, you, you if yeah you're, you're going for a ten x in Bitcoin terms, you have to take some risk. Um, and I think. Uh, it's kind of like parallel approach. Solana is your main position, and some of the Solana uh, altcoins uh, as your riskier play is gonna deliver those results. It's almost like go have some fun on Solana, right? Like they got some projects that are starting to emerge, they're having their use cases, and trying to grow the usage of Sol, which I think we talked about on a recent episode for beta plays for Solana, and they're starting to grow in terms of total value locked of Solana on those protocols. Then you mentioned Star Atlas here, which they're starting to roll out. Last I saw, I saw some gameplay taking place because that that's supposed to be like, what, what was the term? It's like Battle for Keys, I believe was the name of it, where you can go ahead and do like a 1v1 battle and actually you lose your NFT asset of your ship, which is pretty interesting to consider. Oh. Um, Talking about like skin these, in the game, right? <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you're you're putting your what is it, uh, pink slip on the line to go ahead yeah. and and battle and go have some fun. I mean, that was DeFi summer, you know, back in 2019. And, and the more that you took part, the more airdrops there were. I mean, Cosmos had the same type of setup. Like if you went ahead and took place before, uh, I don't remember the date there, but you, know, you were essentially taking part in the Cosmo ecosystem for years on end. Like airdrops, I think, are still paying dividends for being active in that ecosystem. So just trying stuff out for Solana, it sounds like, at least for Cody's realm, that's kind of where he's almost <laughs> headed towards. I, I feel like, Ben, I feel like you're slowly, slowly going, you're being yeah. bought into the Solana world the ecosystem. Maybe it starts with a video game and then it leads on to these uh, these small caps. You're going to have uh, to let us know in the future episodes. I'm, I'm warming up. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> All right, guys. 
Well, I think I think we've gotten everyone's ideas on the table. We've got more of a options play looking at what JJ and Ben are looking at. Um, then we have more of the risk curve. And I think Ray's kind of laid out this idea of moving down the risk curve, playing that momentum and, and Cody having some specific ideas that kind of lines with what Ben just said. Listen, this isn't just going to be about making money. You go play on these ecosystems and you'll be rewarded. Could be the best way with some of the most risk, but could be one of the most interesting ways to 10x your Bitcoin stack. Guys, anything else before we wrap up this discussion? Yes, sir. Don't, right. don't forget to uh, enjoy the outside world. Yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, put some feet on grass. Uh, we didn't talk about other things that you obviously need to consider, you know, things about managing your keys, uh, everything else that could happen in the crypto world. And as Ben just pointed out, this world is, is much more than just making money. So definitely have a plan uh, for what your life looks like as you move through these stages and things get better and better. But with that, we're going we're gonna to wrap up this show. And look, listen, you heard how to maximize your gains before, during, after the ETF. All of these guys are offering a different perspective so that you can take that and figure out where does it fit in your master plan? How much risk do you want to take? What are the plays you think are most likely to pay out? And hopefully you took something here today that you can you can think about how it applies to what you're doing. As uh, Ben said, you know, we're just the computer avatars. This isn't financial advice. We're just having a fun time, having a fun discussion about this topic. But let us know in the comments what you think you're, you're thinking about doing uh, for the ETF and how you're going to play it. And uh, if you've got any ideas of things that we got right, we'd love to hear from you guys. The, the comments are always something we're looking to respond to. And with that, we're going to wrap up the show. No matter what you do, keep some powder dry. Remember to manage your digital risk. This is Marconi White signing off.